Well, my name is Jason Ludwig. I'm the director of the Institutional Outreach for Straight Ahead Ministries. I oversee uh, all of Essex County. So my job primarily is to go inside of all the lockups and um, I get the opportunity to meet with all these youth from ages of 14 to 24 years old on a weekly basis. Um, Monday nights I'm with Charles and Maureen and Emily and there's a whole crew that went on Monday nights. And I'm also up at the uh, Middleton House of Corrections and the Lawrence Prelease in Lawrence, obviously. Uh, work with guys 18 to 24 up there. And so, um, so what is Straight Ahead? Straight Ahead's uh, mission is to see the lives of juvenile offenders be transformed by Jesus Christ. Period. That's it. <laughs> and so there's, a, there's other organizations out there um, that do similar type of work to us, but their main thing is focused on jobs. And so there's a saying that goes around, you give a guy a job, he stays out of jail, and they say it's complete. Bogus. It's not true. And so what is the culture of Straight Ahead? What is the heartbeat of the organization? And so Charles touched on it a little bit. Um, touching, I was talking about a kid yesterday with forgiveness. And so uh, years ago, before I was a believer, I remember going to Wonderland and Revere and betting on the dogs. And so when the dogs come out the track, the first thing that goes first is Swifty, right? If you guys haven't been there. And there goes Swifty! And they wrap the starts running around the track, and then the dogs are chasing this rabbit around the track trying to catch it, and they never do. <laughs> and then they get back into the kennel. Well, I say that's the way the system's set up. Everybody's chasing Swifty. Swifty is people's addictions, people's anger, you know, because everybody responds out of brokenness, right? And so we fulfill a need. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a need inside of us that needs to be fulfilled by God. And if it's not fulfilled by God, we're going to fill it with other things that make us feel good, look good, and all that other good stuff. And so a lot of times out of brokenness, we fulfill it with either uh, sexual desires we fill it with uh, violence, we fill it with drugs, we fill it with alcohol, and blah, 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 gambling, maybe working too much, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And so what happens is that we become uh, behavioral, uh, we get in this uh, mindset of behavioral management. Let me manage my behaviors. Let me, let me focus on my addiction. Let me focus on, 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 on my anger. Let me, let me learn some anger management classes. And so we keep going around this Marlboro burst, Chasing swiftly because we might be able to do it for a day or two, but we always continue to fall on our face. Off our face. Exactly the life I lived for nine and a half years, chasing an addiction, and then out of prison for, for most of my life up to, to the age of 25 years old. Because I was so focused on swiftly, I was so focused on the mechanism, I was so focused on the drugs, the alcohol, my anger. Obviously, right, this is, what, this is what's getting you here, right? This is stuff that's taught to you in the system. Well, if you, if you don't do these things, you won't come back. Well, you know, I've done every stupid program that was in the state, you know, from boot camps to AA to NA and all these different things. And, you know, I can say that there was a piece of every one of them that was good, but they just weren't the game changer for me. And so when I'm talking to all these guys inside of Lockup, you know, these other organizations that are out there, you know, they'll get these guys jobs and they'll, you know, get these guys super busy for a while and they say, oh, great, he hasn't returned to jail. Because, you know, he's preoccupied with his job. And, but... When that organization goes away, when that kid ages out of that organization, then what? Because the job's not, doesn't, it's something you have, it doesn't, it isn't who you are. It's not your way of being. See, God's after our hearts, God's after our way of being. And so if we can get really clear about who we are in Christ, being committed, being honest, have integrity, character, if we can get clear with all them things, those are the game changers. And we can get really clear with Christ and who we are, that no matter where we go, we can transform the environment. And there's not, that's the rock that we stand on. So when I'm going after these youth, when I'm talking to these kids, I'm not even talking about the addiction. Not great, yeah, cool, man. Let, let, what got you there? Because, you know, this whole thing out there, it's a disease. That's BS, man. Listen, man, I got to a point in my life I was shooting needles in my arm. I was a mess. I know about addictions. It's not a disease. It's something, it becomes a part of my identity. And so when I'm talking to these kids, I'm going to tell you about this one youth. There's some stories that he was sharing, but the heartbeat of the organization, the heartbeat of the straight head, this is what we're after. We're doing this uh, seminar, a three-day seminar called Ready for Life. It's a spiritual and character development seminar. It's a leadership development thing. It's powerful. Maureen came in. If you guys ever get a chance to come in, it's three days. If you can sacrifice your time, you want to see God move. It's a personal invitation for me to have you guys want to come and do it all the time inside the institutions. And so, uh, I'm going to tell you about this one kid, Kevin, we did this down in Dartmouth, uh, down in um, Bristol County, uh, early in the year. Kevin's from Haiti. If you met Kevin, Kevin's one of them kids that, like, you just want to be around. Super intelligent. I mean, they, 
he's just super, super smart. He used to tell us stories that when he was in Haiti, growing up as a kid, he would be beaten by his father all the time. Like constant. Even to a point one time he told me his father threw hot sauce in his eyes. Now most kids in the United States would run to drugs and alcohol and different addictions. Kevin used to run to school when he was in Haiti. Kevin loved books. He would read books. He would get educated. And so, um, so that's, where, that's where his intelligence comes from. He's just super, super smart. But the challenge with Kevin is that every relationship in his life has been destroyed because of that incident in his life with his father. And so Kevin's sharing a story about all these different things. And I'm just like, my God, my heart's breaking. Yeah. And so I said, Kevin, I said, man, I says, have you ever been able to forgive your father? And he's like, nah, I forget. Are you crazy? So I'm like, okay, it is a perspective thing, right? Because a lot of times we think forgiveness is for the other person. Sometimes forgiveness does benefit the other person. Actually, forgiveness is actually for us. It needs to let go. Because unforgiveness and resentment is almost like a cup of poison, right, that we mix up for our enemy, but we drink it ourselves. And so when someone offends us, yeah, we heal from the wound, but the thing that leaves spiritually behind us is the unforgiveness. And that's the stuff that keeps us in prison. That's the stuff that cripples us. That's the stuff that continues to make us go to them other things, whatever the addiction may be. And so I said, man, I said, Kev, man, I said, so I started to share a little bit about my story with me and my father, about when I was able to forgive him. Because I started to realize all the stuff in my life was rooted in that. Like, even though it's happened so long ago, it's still subconsciously, it just, it runs us. It just completely operates our whole life, and we don't even, we don't even know what's happening. So anyways, I was talking about uh, my story my father, and just for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of get to follow Kevin, but... So, you know, it was, it was day one. He, he just wasn't trying to hear it, you know what I mean? And Kevin was a believer. And so, um, but it was funny because I said, how many guys, it was 30 guys from, how many guys here have unforgiveness in your life? Every one of them. Bam! I said, see that? That's the answer right there, guys. That is the answer. I said, you guys think it's about managing your, your addictions and your anger and all? That's it. I says, I'm telling you right now, it's one of the ugliest and hottest things to get through, but if you can get on the other side of that bridge, I'm telling you, brother, it's beautiful. I said, you want to talk about freedom? When, the freedom's in, when God talks about freedom in Christ, that's the freedom in Christ. I never experienced complete freedom like that until I was able to release that stuff that I had, the resentment and anger I had towards my father and all the other people in my life. And that stuff, when I was able to let that go, my God, it was like, I, I seen things completely different. I was breathing differently, seeing everything differently. It's like this weight was released off me. It no longer consumed me anymore. And so the next day, day two, Kevin comes back. This whole countenance changed. Something's this guy hopping. What's up with you doing? So you know what debriefing from the he stands up, he's the first one to get up. So we open up day two with like, hey, you know, share about day one. I was able to forgive my father last night. Like, I get it. Like, I get it. I was able to forgive my father last night. I said, What? He's like, Yeah, no, I really get it now. I get what you're saying. It's like, I I you it, it doesn't make an ex, it doesn't excuse him for what he's did, but I I see how it was affecting me, and you know what? I was able to forgive him, man. Like, I get it, you know? And he's a believer, so it was a little bit easy for him to get the forgiveness. It's, it's tough to walk non-believers through this, but, like, he got it. And, like, you just did the, the expression was just completely different. Like, everything was kind of different. And so, like, two weeks later, uh, one of the other workers that um, does a similar work that I do down, down in um, Bristol County was walking by a class. Uh, it was an anger management class. That, you know, one of those classes they mandate you do and get a good time or whatever. And uh, Kevin was teaching the class. And so uh, Kevin uh, walked, um, Kevin was, when he was teaching the class, the other uh, worker walked by and, and Kevin said, it isn't about managing your anger, it's about releasing forgiveness. <laughs> and so he's in this class doing it. And so, and so and it's been powerful. So Kevin's home now, he's doing amazing. Uh, he's building, his, he's actually building his relationship back with his father. Like through all that, he's, he says that even though what his father did to him, he can understand why he did it now. Because he understood the culture and understood his father, the way he was wired. His father did because he could never control Kevin. Because Kevin was actually making his father feel small because of all the education and all that sort of thing. And it's a, it's a different culture down there in Haiti. And so, not to excuse him, but he, but he, he can understand it now, right? He gained understanding. And so, and now he's building his relationship back with his father. And um, in, in the other relationship in life, it's time to get really restored. And so, it's just, it's just a powerful set. That's really the culture to hop into the organization. That's what we're after. That's, that's where you really see God move powerfully. I mean, I can go through stories after story after story about all these amazing things. I'll give you one more before we close. One of the uh, guys I used to work with got stabbed 26 times. He was a crip in Lynn. He got, he got shot, he got stabbed. 
But this one time I got stabbed 26 times by some rival gang members. And the, and the kid, um, and this particular person was on staff with us. Um, and so, that, you know, that was years ago, and his life had changed, and this and that. So he's up at the jail with me on a Friday afternoon, and who goes walking by the hallway? The kid who stabbed him 26 times. And so I noticed something was off with him. I'm like, what's up, dude? Like, what's going on? And like, you know, he's like, that's the dude who stabbed me. So I'm like, oh, great. Like, is he, he's going to do something? Because like, he's on staff. I'm like, is he going to get to do something right now? We're going to get thrown out of here. This isn't good. So I'm like, well, what are you going to do? You know, he says, he goes, and he's crying. He's like, I don't know. He goes, I just don't want to get in the way of him knowing God. Because I'm going to invite him to the group. I'm like, Whoa. What? And so I'm like, that's crazy. So he invites him over, and he never comes. But we did our Ready for Life seminar, and he showed up for that a week later. So after the three days go by, um, one of the exercises called Power Cups were at the end of the, the uh, three-day exercise. And, and, but this is also a place for, like, where guys can ask for uh, forgiveness and, you know, just kind of reconciliation or say some other words to other people in group, that sort of thing. It just happens we wouldn't do these groups, all these guys from the same cities. And so, you'd be, like... One of the guys asked another guy, hey, look, man, I'm sorry for shooting at you that day. I didn't know your kid was in the backseat of the car. Do you forgive me? Hey, man, I'm sorry for jumping you. Uh, you know, I mean, these are the types of things the guys ask and forgive us for each other. It's powerful. So, the kid who stabs this other guy, and mind you, it was, you know, they never told on each other, nothing like that, but everybody in the room knew because it was rival gang members. Well, the kid stands up, the one who stabbed the staff member, and so... Um, the, you know, in the circles, all the participants, but all the staff on the outside just kind of facilitating. And he stands up and says, calls the kid's name out, and goes, we come to the circle. And everybody knew. And when he stood up, man, it wasn't a dry eye in the room. People like, the hottest dude you'd meet just like, we're just starting to cry. So he calls him the circle, and he's like, he's like, you know, the thing I did to you when I was a kid, he goes, I've been carrying it, like, Forever, and he goes. I just can't shake it as much as I can. And I, I just want to say I'm really sorry for what I've done to you. And I, I, I just hope that there's some place in your heart that you can forgive me. I want to know if you can forgive me. Dude, they both hug each other. These are rival gang members. You guys just shoot and stab each other. He literally stabbed him 26 times. And they just cried and cried and hugged each other. You want to talk about true reconciliation? But that, that that only happens because of what God's doing. Stuff is powerful. And so we do this on a weekly basis. Tonight we're celebrating 30 years. Straight ahead, celebrating 30 years. We've got an anniversary this year out in, uh, out in Worcester. And straight ahead, you know, we've been in 60 something juvenile facilities in the state, and we're in about 50 something. There's tons of service opportunities and work. You know, one of the missionaries there at Straight Ahead. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, you know, Charles says, inviting you. Well, I'm a, I'm a big fisherman. I fish for striped bass. I do pretty good. And so what happens, though, is a lot of my buddies will come with me, and they catch a big fish, and then next thing you know, they, I got to listen for, listen to their wives yell at me because all they want to do is fish now. And so I'm going to make that same thing to you, is that if you come inside of the facility, just be ready because it's that addicting, and you may not, you, you, it's going to change your whole life. And so it's a personal invitation to you. Um, and, you know, talking about Maureen, Man, she's like, she's a beast, man. I, I love that woman. She's just like so on fire. Like two weeks ago, uh, one of the units at RFK, these guys are some of the hottest kids in the state. They're doing the most time in juvenile locker for like shootings and all types of crazy stuff. Well, uh, her and James is over there and the other unit. So I'm debriefing with James on Monday morning. Like, hey, what, what happened at RFK last night? He starts laughing because he wouldn't believe it. What? He goes, Maureen had these guys in the room where she's in there with a keyboard, having these dudes sing Titanic, the song from Titanic. The song like, what? So she's never in there singing the song from Titanic. And then he goes, then he let, she let him into worship songs. She's singing worship songs, and then they're all in there in a the Bible study. I'm like, unbelievable. And so it's just like crazy, you know, these guys. And so it's just powerful, man. It's like, so it's like, you know, you just get a chance to see God move. You know, we're, we're all in churches. You all go to church and like, you know, we become believers, and man, it's like, what, what, what is it, man? We, we want to make disciples, right? And we want to get in front of non-believers. But really, think about this. When you really have the opportunity, really, seriously, every single day to witness to people about Christ. I mean, I, mean, I know we do have the opportunity, but really, you know, seriously, think about it. And so I think that's what I love about my job is that I get the opportunity full-time to do this as a missionary every single day to be in front of guys that never heard about Christ. 90% of the guys that I work with have never heard about God before. 
So it's literally just like watching these guys work and just like watching God work and plant the seeds and just letting water and let it be. And so, and I'll wrap up with this. I touched a little bit about my story, man. Like, you know, I did nine and a half years, but my first experience with Christ when I was 14 years old in the juvenile walk-up. I got out of there and I never served God again after that. I never had the resources, that sort of thing. And then my, everything just got bad. I decided doing a ton of time in and out, in and out, to a point where I thought I was going to do the rest of my life in prison. I had a fierce cocaine addiction and I just couldn't shake. And so my last sentence, two and a half years, I don't know what happened, but I says, I'm never going back to this lifestyle again. It got to a point where I was looking in the mirror like, who am I? I, I had no just... No, nothing, I, I had no identity, I was just like a mess, I, I couldn't even stand looking at myself. Well, that last bit in 2002, 2002 to 2004, my, my life got changed. I remember when uh, the pastor up there was preaching, he says, you can't serve two masters, you either serve God or you serve the devil. I'm going to wrap this up in one minute here. And I said, man, I had a moment where my whole life flashed before me. And I knew, I says, wow, I says, I should have actually been serving God, right? And so I said, God, if you're real, I give you my life right now. Scales fell off my eyes. The Holy Spirit came into me, man. I've never been the same since. And so, the funny thing is, I got out in 2004, so I was serving with New Brothers Fellowship, Doug Reagan. I'm sure some of you guys might know them. So I was serving with them. I kept in my church and just started serving God. So I'm new. Prison ministry you now since 2004, but I'm straight ahead for six years. First week I get hired on for straight ahead. Scott Lawson is doing a, a teaching, uh, his uh, week long class. Um, at the seminary, and they said, Jason, share your story. Now, mind you, when I came home in 04, I looked for these guys. For six years, the guys who, who planted that first seed in me, I was 14 years old. So I want to say, hey, thank you, mate, because look, here's some of your long-term fruit. I, I remember that. Couldn't find them. My wife and I just kind of gave up on it. I said, let it be. If it's God, it's God. So I shared my story that day straight ahead. And Hannah, Scott's wife, she's actually one of the stars straight ahead. She said, Jason, did you know they work for us? I'm like, what? The hell are you? <laughs> she said, no, they, they do. So I got to be reunited with John Kinsley, who is the international director of Straight Ed Now. And so after 20 something years, I got reunited with the guy who sowed the seed in me. And what's the trip? The same organization, the same ministry that planted the seed in me is the one I'm now wearing. Mm -hmm. Like, if you told that story, so you, could, you couldn't even write a book and people believe it. That's just, I mean, if that isn't God, I don't know what to tell you. And so listen, I, I thank you, man, for your time. Guys, thank you. This church has been amazing. Support for Straight Ahead. Um, I brought here. Um, uh, a newsletter sign-up sheet. I love for you guys if you want to be just caught up with a newsletter, the service opportunities, that sort of thing. Um, I'd love for you guys to be involved. So, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.